All right, well, uh, thanks, Mick. Yeah, I, look, I, I wasn't completely baffled um, why I was invited here. I mean, I did have a, uh, a message to deliver, and I often get invited to talk about this stuff to, to some quite div diverse audiences. But actually, what it, I, was, I was quite pleasantly surprised as to how much overlap uh, in what I'm going to talk about today that I have with this community. And I guess, I guess coming into this conference, I really saw myself as a user of data. So I, I've been using data uh, to try and understand the innovation process, to look at how people collaborate. Um, but actually, you know, sitting through some of the talks yesterday, I can see how some of the skills that are being developed in this community and some of the challenges that you guys face in preserving data are the sort of, same sort of things that, that us in the, uh, in the science and innovation community, you know, we face as well. So at the end, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for help. I'm going to try and tell you what I'd really, really like. Um, and, and then see if anyone's prepared to uh, take me up on that challenge. So I work at the, um, at the McDiamond Institute uh, for uh, Advanced Materials and Nanotechnology. I'm a theoretical physicist, um, but I can assure you there won't be any equations today, or at least I think not. Um, uh, but there will be a lot of data. So I've been using um, uh, data to try and understand how people collaborate and to understand things about the innovation process. And, and I've just got a plot up here, and we'll, we'll, a, a diagram up here on my title slide, and we'll, I'll tell you what that is in more detail in a while. Um, but that's, um, that's the, uh, the, we've geolocated all the people in New Zealand who filed a patent um, with the Patent Cooperation Treaty Office, and then we've looked at collaborations between these, those people. So we call this the, the innovation ecosystem map, and it's become a bit of a, a cliche uh, to talk about innovation ecosystems, and you'll hear our ministers um, and, and a lot of our public servants uh, talking about innovation ecosystems. And I'm, I will try and make that, that analogy a bit more precise uh, as part of this talk, and I'll, I'll try and understand why even a theoretical physicist, right, we're, we're fairly hard-bitten, uh, equation-driven people, why, why even I uh, think it's worth calling it an ecosystem. Okay, so I just, actually, I, I don't know, uh, I know a lot of people will be from overseas, but if you're a New Zealander, um, you would have heard the news on Saturday that, that Sir Paul Callaghan passed away. Paul had been battling cancer for, for two years. He was, a, he was a close colleague and friend of mine, and he actually motivated uh, a lot of the work uh, that I've done that I'll be presenting as part of this talk. And, um, you know, he was one of the, the greatest New Zealanders and certainly one of the, uh, the greatest New Zealand scientists and probably actually the, the uh, greatest New Zealand scientist that, that did all their work uh, in New Zealand, and it's, you know, it's a great tragedy that, that he's passed away. He was only 64, um, so he still had many active years uh, in him. But one of the things that Paul did that st made him stand out as a scientist was he, he really thought about the, uh, the role of science and innovation and technology in New Zealand, uh, and, and, and in particular, the role that it could play going forward. And one of the things he was worried about um, was the types of, types of things that we do in New Zealand, and, and here's a this is sort of a typical Paul Callaghan headline. Um, Kiwis choose to be poor, laments top scientists. So he was often quoted saying things like this, and he was thinking about the types of, types of things we, we do in our economy. Um, and I'm, so I'm going to start my talk with a few slides that I've, uh, that I've borrowed from Paul, partly as a little bit of a tribute to him, um, but also because it actually motivates some of the things I'm going to talk about. And so I just want to explain what he meant by we choose to be poor. Okay, so this is, this is a plot that this comes straight out of a Paul Callaghan talk um, where he's looking at, at, at how, how different countries, uh, how their GDP is composed. Right? So you can think of this um, as, a, as a, this is a, this is a chart that, that breaks down GDP essentially into a productivity measure. So on the bottom axis we have the output um, uh, in, relative to the OECD average um, per hour worked. Um, and, and so this is the, it's a measure of productivity on the bottom, and then you have how hard um, each, how hard you're working. So how many hours per capita um, people in different countries are working? And you know, perhaps not surprisingly, you know, we all know the French like to take good long holidays, right? And the French are over, way over on the on the extreme uh, uh, right, lower right hand side. So that you know, and they they do disappear for August. It's very hard to find a French colleague. Uh, in August, and you know they take good long holidays, and they're not, you know a bit more concerned about the, the finer things in life than working hard. Um, but it's a, you know it's quite surprising to see the Germans are down there as well. I guess if you've ever been on a Mediterranean beach, uh, you know that there are not many Germans uh, in Germany working hard. A lot of them are, are, are down getting a suntan. Um, and then we have countries that that uh, work a lot harder, but perhaps have lower productivity. So we've heard about Greece 
uh, of course, and, and they're having uh, terrible economic problems. Um, but then it's, it's interesting to put New Zealand on this plot. Um, and, and we're over, you know, we're almost the complete opposite of, of the French. We work very, very hard. So when New Zealanders go overseas, they're very highly valued employees um, because they're, they're known as very, very hard workers. Um, but you'll also see that we're not working very productively, right? So we spend a lot of hours in the office or, or, or uh, in the factory or on the farm, um, but we're actually not working very productively. And this was something that, that of course, concerns a lot of people, um, but it was something that Paul was particularly concerned about um, and has spent a lot of time thinking about. So now, let's look at why. You know, what is it that we're doing, right? So we're, we're obviously not being uh, very productive by OECD standards, so what is it that we're actually doing? And so you can, here's another Paul Callaghan chart uh, where he's looked at the revenue per employee for various industries, okay? And here we have, on the, on the bottom um, axis, we have the FTE of employment, right? So this, this is how many people we have working in a particular industry. And then we've got the revenue per, uh, per person in that industry. And, and our GDP, that's the, that's the dotted line. So we're, if, all do, if we were all doing the same thing, we'd all, you know, all our industries would sit on that dotted line. And, and so, of course, you know, we all know how good the wine industry is, right? We're constantly told how good our wine is, and our wine is very good. Um, but actually, uh, every, for every worker uh, that, that enters the wine industry, we actually, you know, our GDP goes down uh, because, you know, wine is, is not a, a, a very productive industry. Um, it, it's, it's especially uh, a lot of our wine has become a, a commodity, essentially. And the other thing that you'll hear people talk about, well, wine and, and tourism. And again, every time we... Um, uh, we, we add workers to our tourism sector, um, again, our, our, the, you know, our productivity goes down. And you'll see that we have an awful lot of people uh, working in tourism. So, so wine doesn't have a huge impact on our economy. You know, even though it's, it's not very productive, um, there's not too many people working in it. But tourism does, and tourism is one of our biggest sectors. But actually, it's a very low productivity industry. Um, and actually, you'll hear people talking about food manufacturing. And so actually, that's about the average. So, so when we're producing food products, uh, to sell overseas, that, that's essentially we're, we're, we're working at the average um, uh, of, our, of our GDP per capita. Um, but of course, we have to do some stuff to make up for the fact that our tourism industry is very low productivity. And one of the industries that, that, that essentially keeps New Zealand afloat um, is the dairy industry. Okay? So you'll see that, that the dairy industry is actually very, very pr productive in terms of output per worker. Um, and and you know, Fonterra is... is one of the reasons this, this country um, uh, you know, has, a, has a, a, a first world um, economy. Um, so, so the next question you might ask is if we want to lift our productivity, should more of us get into dairying? Right? Should, we be, um, should we be moving dairy cattle down um, Courtney Place um, uh, to, uh, you know, to have them graze on the waterfront somewhere? And the, the big problem is, of course, that we've actually hit some of, you know, we're, we're, one of the things about dairying is it's very land intensive and water intensive. And so actually we're, we're starting to hit some of our environmental limits. Um, so if you, if you want to look, say, you know, you'll, you'll hear our politicians talking about raising our GDP um, to um, Australian levels, then we essentially have to quadruple um, our dairy industry. And, and at the moment our environment's struggling under the strain already. Um, and, and, you know, that's not something we can do very easily. So what are our options? And, and actually, you know, what what comes in as, as one, of our, one of our good options is, is manufacturing, in particular high-tech manufacturing. So in fact, you know, our manufacturing industry is actually very high productivity relative to the lot, a lot of the other things we do in our economy. And if you look at, at the things that we export, um, uh, then actually that's even uh, higher uh, productivity. Um, and and you know, some of the real success stories um, are things like Fisher & Paykel Healthcare. I don't know if you've heard of Fisher & Paykel Healthcare, um, but they're, they're one of our high-tech industries. Uh, very, very productive. They have a revenue employee per employee of, of almost $300,000. Uh, they make respiratory uh, humidifiers and devices for the, uh, for the medical industry. And so Paul's point of view was that we need, to, we need more Fisher & Paykel Healthcare. Okay? And of course, they're, they're based on a lot of technology, uh, there's an awful lot of technology that goes into, into what they do. I mean, if you ever, ever get a chance to go visit their, uh, their factory in, in, um, in Auckland, um, you know, it's a fantastic place to go. It just looks like the future um, has arrived in Auckland. You have these big 
massive open plan offices with engineers sitting there working on products, and the, the engineers can actually watch the products that they've designed sort of pop out of the, of, on the conveyor belt and go off to be packaged. It's a fantastic place if you ever go uh, to see it. So we need more industries like that um, if we want to raise our productivity without sacrificing our environment. Okay, so, so you know, we need to innovate, right? We need, we need to um, uh, come up with new ideas, new technologies, um, uh, to, in order to boost our productivity. And, you know, and there are a lot of people telling us, so, so this is, so Thomas Friedman is, a, is an American author, he was actually here um, a couple of weeks ago uh, talking about uh, his latest book, but he's written a book about, you know, the, the world is flat, you can do anything anywhere now. And, and he's coming from an American perspective, and of course he's seeing um, some of the other uh, global economies, economies like China and India, starting to do some of the things that, that have traditionally been um, the US domain. Um, and, and, and so, you know, on, on, on the face of it, right, we should be quite optimistic in New Zealand because uh, we're being told that you can do anything everywhere, only it's not that simple. Um, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a plot of patents per capita. Um, and so this is the, the number of patents, this, these are triadic patents, so these are patents filed in the US, Japan, um, and Europe uh, per million population. And, and actually, it doesn't look very flat uh, if you look at this plot, and unfortunately, um, New Zealand's in the flattest spot, which is at actually the not very uh, innovative um, spot. And, and it's countries um, uh, uh, like Switzerland, Japan, the, the Nordic countries, um, and, and uh, Germany that actually dominate the, the patents per capita. And New Zealand's not, is just not up there, right? We're not innovating. Um, and so I've been, asking, um, and I've been asking what it is that you do need to do to innovate. And so... The world certainly isn't flat when you start looking at when you start looking at patents. So what is it that 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 is going on? Well, this is this is where the data comes in. So I'm a theoretical physicist. I, you know, it's all very well to talk about innovation ecosystems and sort of wave your arms. I want some equations and I want some data to look at. So I've been looking at a number of um, of data sources, and of course these are these are digital data sources that I can that I can get hold of. Um, so the first thing I've been looking at is patents. So we saw a plot. You know, I've shown you a plot of patents from the OECD. I've been trying to get richer information from the patent database, and I've been trying to use the fact that, that really, actually, it, it's a, uh, what I would call um, a, uh, a triadic uh, data, set of data. Um, there are the patents themselves that you can look at, and, of course, the, the OECD just counts patents and divides by the top, total population. But also on those patents, you have in, uh, records of inventors, and you have records of the applicants. So the applicants are the... Uh, it's typically a company that owns the patent, um, uh, but there are always inventors named on that patent as well. So I, you can actually use this, this triadic set of data, uh, and, and I'll show you in a little while, to build networks and to look at how people are collaborating to produce patents. Um, we've also been using um, export data. So you can look, for example, at the, at the type of things that the type of products that countries export. Um, and then you can ask questions like, are there links between different types of exports. So if, if country A, and I've got a picture of the Netherlands up there, tends to export product A and product B, um, then there might be some link between product A and product B, especially if we find that, that other countries that don't export product A also don't export product B. So we can build up networks um, that way. Um, and then scientific articles as well. So of course there's, there's a lot of information out there about um, about authors and institutes, um, and, and of course, um, a lot of people in the science community work with uh, uh, looking at collaboration networks through the uh, through scientific articles. So I've been using these types of data to understand um, innovation. Okay, so th so the, one of the first things we did was to try and rather than um, rather than look at just patents on a, on a national scale, we wanted to look at them on a regional scale. Um, because one of the things that, um, that I was aware of is that, that, uh, that actually innovation you know, takes place on a very local scale. Right? We, have, we have the Silicon Valleys um, or, or the, you know, the, the Boston area um, or particular areas in Japan or Europe. And these are, these are regions rather than countries. And, and it's these regions that are, that are very innovative. So we looked at the difference between um, Australian cities and New Zealand cities as a function of, of their population size. And we actually found something that surprised us. And although we know that, that per capita, um, Australia produces more patents than us, when we overlaid the New Zealand data on the uh, Australian data, 
um, we found that New Zealand cities are as productive in patents uh, per capita um, as Australian cities, right? So you'll see here that, uh, for example, Auckland um, is a pretty, produces uh, pretty much the same number of patents per capita as Adelaide, right? And the reason that, that Australia produces overall more patents per capita is because Sydney and Melbourne produce more patents per capita. So actually, when, you look at, when you're looking at patents, it's actually not very useful to average over entire countries. You've got to look at cities. So that's one interesting fact. Um, and, and also, this diagram shows us that, that patenting is very regionalized. Okay? So those dashed lines, um, if, if, if the world was flat, right, the data would lie on those dashed lines. The fact that the data doesn't lie on those dashed lines tell us, tells us that the world isn't flat. And in fact, this is, this is part of a bigger picture. There's a lot of other studies that have been done um, and, and, and people know that bigger cities produce more patents per capita. So this is one of the issues that New Zealand faces, that we don't have a large population, we have a relatively distributed population as well, so we don't have regions of very, very high population density, um, and it's these regions that are particularly creative um, and temp tend to pr produce lots of patents. So why might that be? Well, I, I can't give you the complete answer, um, but one of the things we've found is that actually people are better con connected in bigger cities. Okay, so we often, especially in Wellington, we often uh, talk about there only being one or two degrees of separation. Of course, we have a, we have a, telephone, a, a cell phone company that, uh, whose marketing is entirely based on the fact that there are only two degrees of separation between New Zealand. But actually, what we find is that in bigger cities, people are better connected. So this is my first network diagram I'm going to show you. Um, and what, what we've done is we've taken scientific articles um, and, and we've taken a particular snapshot. In this case, we looked at scientific articles that were published in 2009. And then through co-authorships, so, th so through people co-authoring papers, we built the network of, of scientists um, in these different cities. Um, and so, for example, the big blob, it's too hard to present very well, the big blob um, sitting up there on the, on the top left, that's Auckland as represented through its scientific publications. And you'll see there's a big cluster in the middle that's the people, that big cluster in the middle are the people that I can connect through scientific publications. And actually that represents about 70% of, of the scientists in Auckland um, I can connect through scientific publications. But what's interesting is that um, as I go to the bigger cities, um, so as I move to the, uh, uh, to the, um, uh, to the left, uh, uh, to the right on this diagram, actually people become more connected. Um, so what's going on, again, is that in bigger cities we have, we have more collaboration going on. So, so cities actually facilitate uh, collaboration, and I think that's, that, that's partly just because of the increased population density, but also because people can become more specialised. Right? If, if you're in a bigger city, you might tend to be in a bigger university or a bigger research institute, you can have more specialised skills, and that actually makes you more useful as a collaborator. And so people in those environments are, 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 are more collaborative. Okay, so now I want to I want to move on to, to some, a slightly different perspective. I want to talk about ecosystems, um, and we'll eventually come back and, and start looking at collaboration again. Uh, but let's just let's just explore this this innovation ecosystem analogy. Okay, so so to a physicist, right, that 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 plot is an ecosystem. Okay. Um, of course, occasionally we do go out wandering in ecosystems ourselves. Right, we don't just look at it from a data point of view. Um, uh, so I've got a few photos uh, to help you, but this is a plot of, of the distribution of biomass in a forest. Okay, so over, um, over on the far uh, left, right, we've got the big, uh, the totara or the kauri trees, right? So they're very large um, uh, uh, plants. Uh, they've got a lot of biomass, right, but there aren't many of them. Okay, so their density tends to be low. So you'll only find um, uh, you know, one or two in a particular area of the forest. Whereas the, the, the plants with less biomass, um, so the grasses or the tussocks, um, for example, um, they're much more numerous and much more, uh, you, you'll find them much more often, so they're quite high density, uh, but they have lower biomass. And actually, if you, if you go out and you do a survey of the, the, how the biomass is distributed in, the, in, a, in an ecosystem, you find it sits on a straight line. Now, this is a log-log plot. Okay, so this, is, this doesn't mean there's a linear relationship, there's a, there's a non-linear relationship here, um, but in fact you get, you get this nice um, straight line out. And so to a physicist, you know, that, that, that's a property of an ecosystem, right? So, we have, so it's a complex system, 
Um, but nonetheless, we, you know, we can say something about how many large players there'll be and how many small players there'll be uh, in that ecosystem. And actually now I can do the same thing with patents. Okay? So I can look at how patents are distributed amongst companies. Uh, and, and surprisingly, we'll find that actually um, uh, it's a very similar type of distribution. Okay, so now, now what I've done is I've, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of uh, data manipulation that, that's gone on here. I've just, um, and, and the plot's not exactly the same because I'm a little bit lazy to plot it in exactly the same way. Uh, but what I've got here is how patents are distributed amongst, uh, amongst uh, applicants. Okay, so um, uh, this is actually inverted from the, from the ecosystem data, um, but in fact you're seeing we're getting straight lines out here. Now I've got data from the US, from New Zealand, uh, from Australia and Finland. And you'll see that the, that the data actually do uh, fall roughly on straight lines, just like ecosystems. Um, and actually we have a similar sort of property, right? And that there are a few, um, if you want to think of the patents as, as, the, as the size um, of, of the, you know, it's essentially the, the intellectual uh, property portfolio. Um, so out on, the, out on the far right you have companies that hold a very, very large number of patents, okay? And there aren't many of those companies. Uh, whereas over on the, on the left, um, you have companies that hold you know, one or two patents, and of course there are lots of companies that hold one or two patents. So actually, um, you know, there's, a, there's an exact analogy between the, uh, the, um, uh, the real ecosystem, right, if you to go out into the, into the bush and count plants and their biomass, um, or if you go out and, and you look at how patents are distributed amongst companies. So actually there's a lot of similarities that are uh, between the two systems. And in fact, you can go on and you can ask a lot of questions that, that a biologist might ask about uh, a real ecosystem, and actually you find very similar answers uh, when you're looking at innovation ecosystems. So let's just, let's just look at um, uh, what's going on uh, on this plot. So you know, we, we've got grasses and we've got cowrie trees um, in, in, the, um, in the real ecosystem. What's happening in the innovation ecosystem? And actually the example I'm going to use is, is Nokia. Uh, and of course, it's quite interesting to see Jerry Brownlee, and there's a little bit of hot water uh, at the moment. I don't know if you guys caught the news uh, yesterday, but he was he was um, bagging uh, Finland um, in, in Parliament, and it's caused a bit of an international incident. Um, that may be partly related to the fact that I've been pushing Finland <laughs> as an example of 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 a of a very rich innovation ecosystem. Um, so let's just look at, let's look at Nokia. What, what does it look like when we decompose how the patents in Nokia are distributed? Um, so, and, and actually, Nokia's slogan at the moment is connecting people. And actually, this, this is Nokia's people in the patent record. So each of these red dots is an inventor um, that, that works for Nokia. Um, and this is how they're connected. And so this is, this is actually the network of inventors uh, that, that worked for Nokia uh, in 2006. And, and this is just, the, just the, net, the inventors that we can connect together. And you'll see it's a very, very rich, dense collaboration network. And there are about 1,300 people um, in this plot. Um, and, and, and it's a very highly connected network of people. Um, but actually, it's, it's not just about people working together. One of the interesting things is that although Nokia is way out at one end of that particular diagram, um, when we look at how Nokia is com connected to other companies through co-sharing of, of IP, it's, we actually, again, we find a very, very rich network. And th again, these are just the Finnish companies um, that we can connect Nokia to. Um, Nokia is sitting over here in the, in the yellow dot. Oh, actually, it's coming out in green on that screen. So Nokia is over there. And, and that first ring of, um, of companies are the companies that we, Nokia directly shares IP with. So there's about 50 of them. Um, but then we can go out and you can see that there's a very rich network of IP ownership um, in Finland. Um, and so the message is, actually, that, that, that although these big companies uh, are you know, at one end of the, of the innovation ecosystem diagram you know, tend to dominate and tend to be the companies we think about, they're actually embedded in a very rich ecosystem. Um, and, and there's obviously an enormous amount of collaboration going on, not only within the companies, you can see there's you know, a very large a group of people that contributed to the intellectual property portfolio of Nokia, but there's a huge number of companies that also contribute to that intellectual um, uh, property portfolio. So collaboration is a key part um, of, of innovation. I just want to go back now um, and, and let's have a look at the other end. So Nokia is one of the, one of the big trees in the forest. 
what's going on at the other end, is there any interesting, anything interesting to be found there? And actually, um, I'm going to go to the US now and look at some of the, uh, look at a, a network of, um, uh, of companies that, that work in the US. One of those companies is a company called an, uh, Intuitive Surgical. They make medical um, robotic devices. So these are, the, these are the sort of devices that can perform robotic surgery. Um, and they're a, re they're a really interesting company, partly because they've got a New Zealand link. Um, so, so this is um, their, their uh, uh, chief scientist, Catherine Moa, um, and she's actually working with one of their robots there, and she's she was actually born in New Zealand. Um, but they're really interesting, partly because they're, because they're embedded in the, hu in, in the biggest uh, network that we've found. Um, it's got more than 20,000 inventors in it. Um, so we can link 20,000 people. Not surprisingly, right, it's based in California. We, we think of, uh, of California as the, as the innovation hub of, of, um, uh, of the world. Um, but it's not, it's not just based in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. It literally stretches all the way down the, uh, the west coast of the United States. Um, and so it's actually not geographically um, uh, localised in the way that, say, the Nokia network is. It's really based in Helsinki. This is a network that stretches all the way down uh, the, uh, the west, western seaboard um, of the US. And it's not dominated uh, by a single large company. Uh, so there's, you know, it doesn't have a Nokia in there. It's a whole lot of small to medium sized companies. And it was actually really interesting to meet Catherine a couple of years ago. Uh, it was actually, I actually met her here at a conference. Um, and uh, we, just, we had just literally um, uh, found this network of inventors, and I was sitting up the back, and Catherine got up and started talking about, um, about her uh, company. I thought, hang on a minute, she's got to be in this, in this inventor network. And so I, um, I quickly looked at our database, and sure enough, her company's in there. I talked to her afterwards at the, as you said, you know, uh, the, the, um, the wine is, is a very good place to collaborate. Um, so I asked her, you know, did she have any idea uh, she possibly thought I was hitting on her at the time. You know, did, did she have any idea she was in the biggest um, inventor network in the world? And actually, it, 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 it made sense to her, right? And she, she was like, the penny sort of dropped. She says, any time anyone in my industry walks into my office, um, you know, the first thing we do is we work out our pedigree, right? Who worked with who and who worked with who? And we can always find a common ancestor, um, uh, you know, in, our, in, our, in their own collaboration networks. Um, and, and actually, she, she says that the real hub of it was, was Stanford University. It was about three research groups in Stanford University uh, 20 to 30 years ago that really kicked off this, this inventor network. Okay, so I just want to, I want to focus now a little bit on New Zealand. So I've talked a lot about what's going on overseas. Um, now I want to sort of bring it back and, and talk about New Zealand. And so we've been trying to um, understand innovation in New Zealand. And, you know, do we have, you know, the first thing you might ask is do we have uh, networks like those that we see overseas, and, and no, we don't, but we do, have, we do have some things that we can say about some of the collaboration that's going on in New Zealand. Um, so as I, uh, <clears throat> uh, as I said on my title slide, um, we've been geolocating all the inventors in New Zealand, and actually, so we've, we've actually been geolocating all the inventors all the way around the world um, to look at collaborations between them. So, so that what I've got here is a plot, um, so over on the, on the left, that's Auckland, um, and this is actually the largest inventor network in New Zealand. Um, that's what I've got on the centre there. Um, and on the, on the left, I've just zoomed into the component that's in Auckland. Um, but we can actually look at all the inventors, so that's on, the, that's on the top right. And then we can look at how all those inventors are connected overseas. And actually, you can go download this yourself if you want. Um, so, it's, so it's available on my blog. So if you do have a patent, I don't know um, if, if that's something that people in this community do. Um, if you're out there patenting algorithms, um, uh, you could go see uh, who you're connected to on, on, on my network map. Um, and just to, you know, let's have a look at this largest connected component. What is it? Well, it has, it has 450 inventors, so there's 450 people. Um, there's probably more. This is, this, this is data that we took up to 2009. Um, there are 14 companies, New Zealand companies in it, four Crown Research Institutes and three universities. Um, and it, actually, we talked about Fonterra before, and Fonterra's in there. Um, so Fonterra, um, a number of the patents you'll see um, uh, of people working in Palmerston North, uh, in the centre of, of the North Island. Uh, and so they're, they're working for Fonterra. Um, also, Massey University. Of course, Massey University is just across the road, so it's good that these two organisations collaborate, so that's nice to see. 
Um, Ag Research, right? That's our big Crown Research Institute that's involved in, um, uh, in in doing research for the primary sector. So it's again, it's very good that they're involved. University of Otago, well, Ag Research also has one of its big research centres down in, in Dunedin. Um, so it's good to see that uh, they're collaborating with people in the University of Otago. Industrial Research Limited, now that's a bit weird um, because these are the guys that, that are, are, are working with um, the manufacturing industry. So that's a little bit unusual. Um, but then also Fisher and Paykel Healthcare uh, is part of that network. Um, so I have no idea what, how, how, you know, what, what the connections are between Fisher and Paykel Healthcare and Fonterra, but they exist. Um, then Neuron Pharmaceuticals, um, the Maligan Medical Research Institute, um, and then you can actually connect, if you go look offshore at who, who the industries are that these, that these businesses are connected offshore, it's the pharmaceutical industry. So that's some of our biggest linkages. You'll often hear people talking about trying to make a sectoral analysis. They'll be trying to talk about how you know, we, need to, we need to invest mainly in, our, in, our, in research and, te and, and technology in our primary sector, um, but actually this, this diagram you know, shows it's a much, much richer picture than, than people would, would realise. Actually, there's a lot of disparate um, organisations in New Zealand that are, that are sharing skills and, and knowledge um, uh, between themselves through this innovation network. Okay, so I just want to talk briefly just about something. I'm not going to dwell on this for, uh, for very long, but it's kind of a really interesting thing that we've been doing recently. Um, there was some, uh, a collaboration between some physicists um, and some economists at Harvard and MIT, and they've been looking at the relationships between products. And, and they've actually produced diagrams like this um, that look at the relationships between products that, that countries export. So I talked about, you know, this, this is another type of data source that you can use, we, uh, as well as patents. You can look at the types of products that countries export, and if, you know, if countries tend to export pairs of different types of products, then there's probably some relationship between those products, i.e. you need to be able to make product A in order to be able to make product B. Um, or they might share some common capability uh, that, that allows you to make both product A and product B. And so you can produce this, this network diagram of products. And so what actually what I've done here so, um, is, um, is I've put some of New, New Zealand's comparative advantages onto this plot. So the first thing actually about this diagram is you'll see there's a very dense region in the centre. Okay? And, and that actually corresponds to the most complex products. Um, so there's not many countries that produce the most complex products, uh, but when there are complex products, those countries tend to export a lot of those different types of complex products. So there's a lot of relationships between products in the centre. And you'll see it out here um, on, the, on the bottom right, you know, there's, there's electronics. Okay? So electronics, there's a lot of complexity in there, um, and so there's a lot of linkages between electronic products. Um, on the outside of the diagram, right, these are the primary sector commodity products, right? So you have things like um, fish, uh, uh, agricultural products like milk, um, fruits, and so forth. And that's outside on the, that's on the outside of the diagram. And that's telling you, you know, it's simply telling you you don't need much capability in order to, to export those particular products. And often, of course, it's based on, on what sort of climactic or natural resources you have climactic advantage you might have um, as to whether you can produce those particular primary products. So actually, and it, t it turns out, and it's, um, there's a very strong correlation uh, between being able to produce products that sit in the centre of the diagram and productivity. Right? So to bring it back to that productivity argument, what you need to do, right, if you're a developing country, is move from the outside of that diagram, um, from commodity products, into the centre. Right? Now the black dots on, on that uh, diagram um, are New Zealand's um, uh, strengths. Um, and, and you'll see that, by and large, we're sitting on the outside of the diagram. Um, and, and so you know, that, that partly explains uh, why our productivity is so low, is because a lot, of our, a lot of our products are based on the outside commodity part of that diagram. So one of the challenges for New Zealand um, is to move into the centre. Um, and one of the problems is when you look at the types of science we're doing, I'm just going to get up on my soapbox for a, for a little while, and um, uh, is that largely, our, you know, a lot of our science is directed at things on the outside of that diagram. So you'll see the biggest um, chunk of science that we do, plant, animal, agriculture, and environmental science, corresponds to, to products on the outside of that diagram. So we can learn something um, uh, uh, from this type of complexity analysis about the types of things we're doing. So I'll just I'll get back off my soapbox now, and, and we'll move on. We'll go back to this diagram. 
Um, and, and I just wanted to, um, to look at what, what is it that, that creates the biomass. Okay, so you'll see uh, one of the interesting things about those, those plots um, is that the slopes are roughly the same. Actually, they're not exactly the same, and we've done a lot of analysis uh, on how the slopes of those lines differ, um, but you'll see they're roughly the same. Um, but but it, it, it's not just a population basis, because Finland has a population of about 5 million people. Uh, Australia, of course, has a population of about 20 million people. And you'll see that the Finnish data lies pretty much on top of the, of the Australian data. So what is it that gives these innovation ecosystems their biomass? Um, uh, well, it's spending on, on research and development. Uh, and if you, if you divide out uh, those diagrams by the amount of money that's spent, um, then uh, by, in, in particular, in, in this particular plot, it's the, it's the business expenditure on R&D. &R &D. Um, it's actually, that's what, it's the dollars that gives you the biomass. If you do that, actually, New Zealand doesn't come out too badly, right? We actually punch above our weight on innovation based on what we spend. And I think this is one of the problems with, with, uh, with the way we approach things in New Zealand, is we're often very concerned with making our systems very, very efficient. Um, and, and you can see that we've done that, right? We, per dollar spent, we get a higher number of patents um, uh, than, um, than the Finns or the Australians or the Americans. Um, but we're not as concerned about the impact that those patents, um, that, that that spending has. Um, and and often, often I think we put efficiency before impact. Okay, so, um, so I'm just going to, so I've given you a bit of a tour of some of the work we're doing um, with uh, looking at innovation ecosystems. I just want to um, now sort of talk about, you know, what I would like to do going forward and perhaps how this um, community could help us. Um, so so one, of the, one of the phrases I've been using for a couple of years now is I've been talking about, you know, building a city of four million people. Right, and this is really based on the idea um, that if we could actually, if New Zealanders interacted, right, as if they were in a city of four million people, as if we were Sydney rather than spread out over the entire country, then actually we could, you know, we might be able to lift some of these indicators up to where um, we were, we were um, comparable to Sydney um, or, or Melbourne. Right, so we could lift our, if, if we could interact as if we were a city of four million people, um, we, we could lift our GDP, lift our patents per capita, um, and, and of course part of that, part of the clue as to how to do that is how to collaborate as if we were a city of four million people. Um, so what can we do to learn, what can we learn uh, 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 to, to, to do so that we act like a city of four million? Um, and, and of course I think part of the, part of the key uh, is looking at collaboration and how we can increase collaboration. So just, just a quick um, uh, sketch, you know, why collaboration is important. Well, you know, the Industrial Revolution, it was driven by specialisation um, and increasing returns to scale and manufacturing. Um, and, and actually knowledge, you know, the, 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 the revolution that we're going through at the moment is being driven by similar effects, right? People are becoming more and more specialised um, and, and, you know, a, a scientist these days um, uh, you know, takes from, from university, it, it might be about 15 years before you're op operating as an independent um, scientist uh, from high school uh, through your university education, uh, through your PhD and through your postdoctoral fellowship. Um, and, and so actually, you know, in response to that, to this increasing specialisation, we're finding we're having to work in bigger teams. Right, so the teams that we're working in, and that comes out very much from our data, we can see that people are working in bigger, bigger and bigger teams, there are bigger and bigger networks of, um, of researchers working together, um, and that's, that's because of the increasing specialisation, right? the problems that we're having to solve are getting harder, and so we need to work in these larger multidisciplinary teams, um, and as a small country, right, we need to figure out how to, how to, how to build these teams across the country. Um, and so we've got to uh, embrace open research and data exchange, and we have to do this not only between our institutes, between our government departments, but also between our country, our companies, um, and our regions. Um, so I'll just very quickly, there, there have been some experiments uh, down this line, and one of the reasons I got very interested in this is that, of course, the organisation I work for is exactly one of these experiments. Um, we're one of the centres of research excellence uh, with the McDiamond Institute up in the, uh, in the top right there. Um, and we're a distributed uh, research institute. Um, so we're actually distributed around the country. Although we have our headquarters here in Wellington, uh, we have researchers in Auckland University, Massey University, uh, Wellington, and Christchurch, and Dunedin. So we're actually distributed across the country. And we've actually been able to do this. Um, we've been able to build this, this knowledge network uh, of people interacting 
And so this is based on our scientific publications. And so we were created in 2002. Um, and you can see that we, were, we consisted of a, of a, of a sort of rather disparate um, group of people. There was collaboration going on, um, but actually, you know, after, um, after uh, uh, six or seven years of funding and actually working together as a group and using a lot of tools for collaboration, we've been a, you know, greatly increase uh, the level of collaboration uh, between the researchers in New Zealand. So there are experiments out there that have worked, that have put together these knowledge networks from around the country uh, to build something that has scale and, and increased impact. Um, so I'm just going to sort of finish off with my wish list now. Um, as to what we might do, and you know, talk a little bit um, just briefly about the sort of things I think this community could help us with. So first of all, I mean, I think there actually need, needs to be a culture change in New Zealand. I think, you know, I work in the innovation system, and, and I quite often have to um, uh, uh, get into IP negotiations with the companies or the organisations I work for, and actually, it's very, very hard. I think New Zealand, um, as a as a country, our organisations and our institutes are, are too keen. Uh, to retain control of their intellectual property. And I think that means we waste a lot of our intellectual property. The intellectual property is not sitting where it could be best, be best be used, and we're not embedding that intellectual property properly in our innovation ecosystem. So we do need a, and, I, you know, and it's really pleasing to, to, to hear the same messages coming from this community that we need to collaborate um, uh, in order to have more, more impact. So I think that's something that has to be, that message has to be gotten out to the rest of New Zealand as well. And so you guys can help do that job. Um, also, one of the things that comes up, and this comes up constantly, and, and this is related to, to why I think big cities are more productive, um, is that people need to find other people. Okay, we actually, it's very hard in New Zealand uh, to find out who's doing what. It's surprisingly hard. And, uh, you know, of course, if you're all, if, you, if everybody's working sort of in, in CBD Sydney, um, it's a lot easier. You might bump into the person you need to know um, having coffee. Um, but in New Zealand, it's actually very, very difficult to find out what's going on. So there are some tools. So we've, we've, um, this is one of the reasons we've released this tool and, 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 and just, are just giving it away, is to help people find other people. But I have to say, you know, some of these pictures look good, and it's quite fun, fun to do the Google Earth flyover um, of, of, of all the inventors in New Zealand, but it's not yet a tool that is really much use for, uh, for finding people with particular skills or particular bits of expertise. Um, this is something that's come out of MSI, and gosh, I, would, I don't know if there's anyone from MSI here today, but it would be really great if, if, if MSI went and talked to some people in this community about making uh, uh, digital records available. Um, MSI have a, have a database of all the funding they've ever given out um, uh, to organisations or to, to individuals, and you can go search it, um, but it's very, very hard to get at the sort of information that I think people really need to know. Right? You can work out you know, how much money was given to an organisation over some period of time, but you really, it's very difficult to work out what that organisation did with that money. Uh, you know, was there any, were there any skills gained? And so I think actually we've got to, we've got to get, you know, especially when we've got public spending um, going into, uh, into organisations, you know, the information about what impact that public spending had really should be available to everyone, and, and we, you know, we're not making it available to people. I mean, there are tools out there um, so, so in the scientific world, right, there's a lot of um, companies that will sell you uh, information about who's published what, um, and there's even stuff that's starting to become available uh, in the open. So, so Thomson Reuters have their web of science, um, the Elsevier Publishing Network have um, Cyverse and, the, and their Scopus search engine, and now there's Google Scholar, right, and this does allow you to search um, uh, for uh, people who have published in certain areas, but it's a long way from allowing you to find that person you need um, in order to collaborate with. And then, you know, I think also ideas need to find other ideas, okay? And I think this is probably where you guys and, and the sort of thing that you're doing um, and, you know, a lot of the talks that I've been seeing from people, you know, if those tools could be more widely deployed and what we're doing, and it's not just about... Um, uh, uh, you know, finding, finding historical records of what's, what's been done, but also real time. You know, who's doing what in New Zealand? And if I've got an idea, you know, how do I, how do I marry it um, to another idea that might be here uh, in New Zealand? And so I think we need better data management. Okay, so I'm going to uh, wrap up there, and um, I'm happy to take some questions if we've got time. I've eaten into coffee, uh, I see, um, uh, which may make 
have made some people a little bit grumpy. Um, but we'll, we'll see how grumpy Mick is and whether he gives me a chance for questions. Okay, so, so I, I can take a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, yeah. So we've had some, we've had some, a little bit of interaction with uh, with Louis um, Bessencourt, who's at the Santa Fe Institute. So, so I'm not working directly with Jeffrey, um, but indirectly. You could find us on a, on a, on, you know, two degrees of separation. Yeah, and and of course, a lot of their work has has um, uh, uh, looked at looked at similar things in the US. I understand that the School of Management at the Victoria University is doing quite a lot of work in biological um, sort of modeling of, of, of um, networks, especially social networks, autopoiesis and all of that. Do you see relevance in, in how that kind of social networks and learning systems? Yeah, I mean, so, so, so definitely we're looking at, I mean, we're, you know, I think, I think by and large when we look at these types of networks, um, uh, we, then th there's some differences to social networks. So we can see there are other things that are going on in these types of innovation networks. So they're not, they don't behave exactly the way that social networks do. But it's very interesting to compare you know, purely social networks that come about through Facebook, say, with, with these innovation networks. And there are some similarities, yeah. But there's some important differences as well. Yeah. When you say you would like to see a, um, a culture change in terms of intellectual property, how do you think you could do that in a way that deals to the fear? The fear of, of losing ownership. Absolutely. I mean, we, Māori have, are in that position when it comes to their manuka honey products, etc., which has now become a, a, quite a booming business, yep. and they haven't seen any of the returns. And I'm not trying to be an activist here. No, I'm just no, questioning I, I, how, no. how you would like to... See that done. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's a real that's a very real concern, right? And I think I think that's actually one of the big barriers. And and so it's not just Maori that, that have that fear, but actually Fonterra. <laughs> Fonterra are one of the most afraid companies. <laughs> I hope there's no one from Fonterra. <laughs> but that, that that's exactly the problem that they have, right? They want to do everything in house, um, and and they they're very very protective of that in house IP. Um, and and I I just think, you know. Part of what keeps value and what keeps uh, 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 industry and activities here in New Zealand is the fact that there are other things going on in New Zealand that will keep them here, right? So, so it's actually that collaboration um, uh, between different New Zealand organisations that will ultimately keep that activity based here in New Zealand. And I think, I think we've just got to, we've got to tell more of these stories of collaboration and sharing um, for... Uh, um, you know, especially when you look at what's going on overseas, you know, a company like Nokia, you know, has a much, much wider range of, of, of collaborations uh, than, than a company like Fonterra, for example. So I think it's about telling those stories, and it's about just, just saying that, that actually with, um, with some goodwill and collaboration that, that value can be kept, that, you know, both communities can share the value um, of that, that knowledge. <laughs> 